You're listening to the Reds Podcast. This is episode number 140. My guest left the best job he ever had to pursue a dream, and he's here today to talk about it. John Acuff is on the Red Podcast. That's coming up. This is the Red Podcast. Real entrepreneur development. Make more money, work less, and live a life of freedom. No BS advice that really works. Here's your hosts, David Hooper and Laurel Staples. John Acuff's in the Red Room today. His new book, Do Over, Rescue Monday, Reinvent Your Work and Never Get Stuck. It's actually coming out tomorrow, man. Big day. You nervous? Very. But being in a padded room with you helps. Hopefully this is not an indication of where I'll end up. (laughs) There's nothing weird about two guys in a small little room. No, no, a tiny room with red and uh, and black padding. (laughs) Well, I want to get to the backstory. When I met you, it was 18 months ago. And of course, you've had a career well before that. But just the past 18 months, let's talk about it. It was a big event. Met you in the green room. Outside of the green room, six or 700 people. They're there to see you. The book was called Start. And I remember driving up and there's this big switch. Like you're going to start it from average to awesome. And like a week later, you walked away from it. Yeah, that sounds crazy when you say it in a sentence. Talk about wild weeks. It was a wild week. It was the biggest event I'd ever done. Then I I went through a career transition the next week. Um, And so, yeah, the last 18 months feel like it's been, in some ways, nine years. And in other ways, it feels like nine minutes. Well, this is what I love about it because the book, again, Do Over, Rescue Monday, Reinvent Your Work and Never Get Stuck. So many times you have somebody write about something that happened years and years ago. and They're so far removed from it, but you're right in the middle of this. Yeah, I feel like the the books I like to write, I write from the trenches. I hate, you know, it's like the 21-year-old life coach um, where you go, well, what, you know, what's happened so far that you're, what, what yeah. well of experience are you, right, are you life coaching me from right now? Sure, the, the memoir at age 25. Yeah, and so I feel like that's what I like to write about. So when I, when I went through my own do-over moment, I wrote this book because I needed it, and then I went around the country and, and talked to other people to see if they needed it too. Let's dive back into your own do-over moment, because not only were you having your own events, you were on the road all the time, dozens of dates a year. You told me, hey, I'm opening up for Malcolm Gladwell next week. Kind of a big deal. Sure. And you walked away from it. I know. I know. Yeah, I think it didn't make sense to a lot of people um, on the outside, but it's one of those things where if I'm going to write books encouraging and challenging people to take risks and do things that are brave, I I need to be doing things that are brave too, even if they don't make sense um, to some people. And so that's, that's what I felt like that moment was like. And I went through this, this big do over and it's been really fun and really scary and really awkward and really awesome. And everything that comes along with that, what I've learned, one thing I learned is it's easier to write books telling people to do brave things than it is to do them yourself. Like it's way easier to be motivational on the internet than to actually do something in your own life. Absolutely. How did you know it was time? And I'm curious regarding the timing. A lot of times people walk away from something. It's what we call a carrot in a stick. They walk away from something painful. I'm curious to know if you were walking away from something painful or if you were going to something better, the carrot. Yeah, I, I didn't have a I didn't have a plan um, as far as these. Like, I didn't jump to ten things I had lined up. Um, so that that wasn't the situation there. But for me, it was really about realizing that the company I worked for wanted to play football, and I wanted to play basketball. And it didn't mean that football was bad and basketball was good. It just meant they're different sports. And eventually, you start to see two roads leading in different directions. And if there's one you know you're supposed to be on, even if there's things you lose when you leave, even if there's things that are hard when you leave, you get to a point where you have to leave. And for me, I don't know. I've The last 18 months, I've really realized like the money, the fame, that any of the stuff that comes with, with, you know, that people offer you when you do things, eventually it's pretty empty. And I didn't learn that there. I've learned that on my own of going, I think one of the big lessons I've learned is that the worst boss I ever had was me. So I didn't, I didn't escape a bad situation and go, now I've got it. Like right. I jumped into something and realized, wow, a lot of the challenges I've had, I've created myself, you know, cause now I'm on my own. What am I going to do to, to work on them? You see people that often move, we call it a geographic cure. 
And you've probably heard the saying, no matter where you go, there you are. Yeah, Hawaii can suck. <laughs> Your problems are coming with you. Yeah. I'm curious about the inside versus the outside. On the outside, you've got people celebrating you, people who aren't going to understand, like me joking around. You walked away. You walked away. I wasn't the only one. A lot of people were coming to you and say, how could you walk away from this? You had New York Times bestseller, Wall Street Journal bestseller, USA Today bestseller. It had been out for five months. It wasn't like that was nine years right. ago. Right. It wasn't like this was like the graveyard of your career. You were sure. right in the middle of it. But the inside is always different from the outside. What about having that kind of success was different than you thought it was going to be when you were looking at it from the outside? Um, I think I think everything's different on the inside than the outside. Uh, you and I talk about this a lot because we get to have conversations that that aren't on podcasts, and then it's fun to come in and have some that are on podcasts. Where like what the what the perception on the internet is always different from the reality. Um, recently, I had a book launch party, and a friend made a magnet for his antique yellow truck, which was so kind of him. And it was a magnet of the book cover for do-over. Because the book cover's yellow. The book cover's yellow. And so, like, I posted a picture of me in the truck, and so many people were like, I can't believe you bought a truck. Like, that's (laughs) such a big investment. And I hadn't tweeted, like, this is the truck I just bought. Like, (laughs) you know, like, it was a fun kind of kit. And so, like, the perception was so different. So I think for me, the perception of, um, you know, realizing, I think one of the big perceptions that changed was I want to be an entrepreneur. I never would have said that. Um, and then as I started to kind of build these things and believe that you get to do stuff in a way that you've never been able to do stuff that, you know, Godin always talks about that Seth Godin, like what to do when it's your turn and it's always your turn. And you go, wow, there's a lot of stuff I could do on my own. And there's a lot of stuff I can do with a team, but this stuff I want to try on my own like, I want the freedom to go in a lot of different directions if those are the directions I feel called. Well, going back to the start event, I run events myself. And one of the things that was amazing to me is you had this huge staff and infrastructure. You had the sound guy and the lighting guys and techno music, smoke machines, lights when you come out on the stage. And that's not easy to do. You have to have the infrastructure to do that. When you walked away from that, that was all gone. What are some of the surprises and differences that you found from being self-employed really for the first time? Yeah, yeah, uh, it was intimidating. I, I'm not as good as I thought I was. Um, I you was, thought that was all you, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, honestly, yeah. Like, and that was me, like getting lost in entitlement, getting lost in ego. I had a friend the other day say, hey, you seem like a whole lot less of a jerk than you used to be. <laughs> and I received that as the compliment he meant it as. And, right. and so, yeah, when I was there with that staff, like there was definitely a part of me that was like, I show up, I'm the talent, you yeah. know, like, I don't know how celebrities that are real famous and have real attention don't become just huge jerks. Cause I got a little bit and was able to get entitled on that. So one of the big surprises was when I left that space like I had an event the other day and I was in charge of it. And that meant going to Costco to get brownie bites for the snacks. And that, you know, like <laughs> yeah. all the little things yeah. that there's no brownie bites person anymore in my life that is in charge of catering. Like that <laughs> hat is on mine. So I think as an entrepreneur, you realize this hat rack is gigantic and I'm horrible at most of these hats. And I don't have the money yet to hire the hat at. I just have to do it. Right, right. Well, it's, it's like you don't have that position assistant to Mr. Acuff. No, no. And, and I'm trying to get there, but I'm not there yet. So when people, you know, yeah, and that, that staff, the live events team at the Dave Ramsey team is bonkers. They are amazing. They were that incredible. was unbelievable. Super smooth. And incredible. so, and there were so many talented people that I worked with in so many different facets when I was there. And so, yeah, leaving that space with some, some degree of ego and like, the last 18 months have been very humbling and I think a really healthy way and not fun. Like humbling situations, people who tell you a humbling situation is fun is a liar. Like th- there's been a lot of moments in the last 18 months where I go, oh, I wish I didn't have to learn that lesson. But I think in a year from now, I'm going to be glad I did. I remember when I quit my last job and it was like one of those Jerry Maguire moments. I went out with the lid off and I was so proud of myself. I mean, it was so violent, John, that they actually called security in on me because I was on a tear. It was like the Newsies. That's how I think. Like, you're like, open the gates, seize the day. Like, you, you started a newspaper revolution. <laughs> totally. I thought I was doing that. But I remember getting home, and it was like, oh, my gosh, what have I done? And I went for a walk, and I was walking by. They used to have these, I guess it's like a help-wanted paper, like a free weekly. And I sure. remember looking at these jobs and thinking, like, they were that bad that it made me get back on and remember why I had quit. But did, did you have moments like that? I guess that's the 
the short version of the question. Did you have moments where you were like, what have I done? Yeah, I was depressed for like six months. Um, I focused on just like gaining weight and being, <laughs> being sad. Those are the two activities I did. Yeah, mastered um, them. Yeah, I mastered them. Um, yeah, totally. And it wasn't, it wasn't so much as what have I done, but what will I do next? Um, that, was, that was kind of the, the what now question was the big one for me because there was definitely that concern of, Will publishers be interested? You know, will I still be able to do speaking events? Like all, everything I had done was through that organization. So you have to understand it was a three, like from a musical term, it was a 360 deal where everything was through that organization. So when I left, everything was left behind. They owned everything. Well, just the idea of like, they were, they were booking my gigs. They were doing like, my book was published through there. So not, I don't mean in an ownership way. I just mean in a, they were handling everything. So the real challenge to me was I had been off the market, so to speak, for three years. I didn't know how to book gigs. I didn't right. know. I didn't have any infrastructure. Right. So that was where it was overwhelming. And yeah, there was definitely a lot of, I don't know. I think people want to believe the, this idea that like when you jump out, it's, you know, a nonstop Jerry Maguire moment where sure. you're just like, oh my gosh. And you hear like Coldplay, like Viva La Vida. And like, that's how your day goes. And it's just you constantly jumping in the air, like a Toyota commercial, like, yeah, I did it, you know? And that is not how life works. If you figure that out, please become my life coach. Well, one of the things I'm curious about too, is that you walked away from a very public situation. Dave Ramsey, as you mentioned, I was in Arizona in the back of a four by four on some kind of desert tour. I told somebody I'm from Nashville, like, oh yeah, Dave Ramsey. People know this guy. A lot of people are watching him. As a matter of fact, I'd just been to your event. I even had my father call me. He goes, hey, man, uh, I think that event from that guy you went to last week, he's on the news right now because he's left Dave Ramsey. It, it was local news here. and it's Which is so silly in the sense of, like, people leave jobs every day. But you left one where everybody is watching you, and I would love to know how that upped the ante and how that affected you because one of the things about Dave Ramsey, he has these – morality rules for his employees. And one of them is like, if you cheat, I'm going to give my Dave Ramsey impression. If you cheat, you're fired. We're not talking. And I never thought about you walking away from that job that people might suspect that there was something more sinister about it than you wanting to pursue a dream. Yeah. And I I think that what I learned is that in the absence of a story, people write their own. Um, and, and so I try, I've tried to be very clear about that. Like there was, it was never about moral failure on any side of the company on, on my life. It wasn't, um, this was, a, you know, something that my wife and I certainly talked about and, and prayed about and worked on. It wasn't, it was by no means like that, but yet it upped the ante. I think the hard part for me to tell you the truth was that the, the conversation I'd had online since 2007, really, where I started kind of my, my first blog of any size was about being authentic and transparent and, and sharing my life and going, hey, here's what I'm going through. Here's here's the messy parts. Like, this sucks, and I did this the wrong way, and I wish I hadn't. I hope you don't. Um, so then when that happened, there were a lot of people that had questions because suddenly what I had done for seven years got broken. And by broken, I meant, like, it was a, a job. Like, I couldn't share details because there's HR rules. And just like right. I wouldn't ask, you know, People would say, I demand to know the reason. And I wanted to say, well, tell me your salary. Like, tweet that out. Like, tweet out your salary and your private conversation with your boss, and then I'll let you. And so for me, I felt that in order to respect the situation I had been part of, which, you know, was great, I had to hold off on sharing the details, just like I wouldn't share details that were intimate to any job I left. Something I've noticed from my work in the music industry, but just being on the internet in general, when you're reaching out to a lot of people as you do, is that people think that they know you, but they don't. They know a part of you that comes in when a situation like this happens. They have filled in the blanks, as you say, they create their own story, and then something shatters that belief. I wonder if it keeps people from having these do-over moments, knowing that they're going to be under a microscope because on one hand, watching you do this because you made it look flawless, it's very inspiring. But on the other hand, for somebody who is maybe sensitive, having somebody watch them and analyze their every move, you're certainly opening yourself up to that. Jenny, my wife, doesn't care what anyone thinks about her. Like she could care less. I, on the other hand, care about what strangers I've never met, like if they like me enough. Um, it's kind of the George Costanza on Seinfeld where he was concerned, like, 
does the waitress like him? Like, do they have good rapport? And so we try to meet in the middle somewhere. But yeah, I think there are a lot of people that um, when they think about having a do-over moment or, and it can be a good one or a bad one. A do-over can be, you know, moving to Nashville. Like we, we talk about that all the time. We live in a jump city where people jump from another city to, to move here. Right. And they worry about, you know, what will my parents say if I take this opportunity or what will somebody else say? And so I, I definitely think about that. You have to do the right thing. Um, you have to do the thing you think you're supposed to do and whether or not people understand it or not is, is okay. Um, and it, yeah, it wasn't flawless. Like good grief. I feel like there were so many days I've said this before where I just felt like I was wearing roller skates on an ice skating rink and like I had all this motion, but I wasn't going anywhere. And I just felt so stuck. So it was by no means flawless. If it looked that way, then that was a filter on Instagram. That was me filling in the blanks, just like everybody yeah, else yeah, does. Exactly. Let's talk about your family. You've got Jenny, two kids. Yep. So it's not just you. That's another thing that can complicate a do-over because it would be one thing if you were 25 and single, but you, you got three mouths, right? Goatee, cool pet, like a sugar glider. And I'm like, just me and you, buddy. <laughs> just me and you, Roscoe, my sugar glider. Let's move right. to Nashville. But the ante is upped. You've yeah. got a mortgage. You know, you're in the middle of your life Like, I'm here. an adult. I'm a grown adult. I know. And we <laughs> expect a lot from adults in this society. <laughs> yeah. So that definitely... I mean, that definitely ups the ante, but it also ups the adventure because you get to go on it with other people. You and I, we need to do a whole episode on what a life hack having a spouse or a partner that believes in you and loves you and supports you really is. I mean, we've talked about how important Laurel, um, how, how you guys work together and push in the same direction and help each other with each other's dreams and, and what that does. So having a wife like Jenny has been amazing. Um, having kids... That will, you know, tell you the truth. I remember when I left, I, um, we were sitting around the fire um, and my, my youngest daughter said, dad doesn't have a job anymore. And that was kind of like crushed me. And my oldest daughter said, yeah, he does. Now it's to be around. Um, yeah. And that was like the set, like, and kids fists are tiny, but powerful. And, and so even now though, I'm trying to go, okay, I was traveling a ton then, but I'm still traveling some. How do I balance that? Um, but yeah, it definitely ups the ante. And I think that's why I want to encourage people is that the myth of dreaming that you only get to do it when you don't have any responsibilities or you get to do it and like leave all your responsibilities behind, I think just wrecks life. I think too, you've got this inertia that you've got to get over when you're starting something as you found with the last 18 months. But now that things are rolling, you wouldn't go back 19 months ago to how things were. No, no. Because it's much it's, better. It's easier. You've got yeah. more time. Yeah, I, I get to do this for a few hours in the day. Um, you know, I get to see my kids get off the bus. Um, you know, I get to, we'll go, you know, we did Maine last summer for a couple of weeks. And yeah, it's, I've reshaped it. And, and it's, there's still lots of hard moments. There's still lots of awkward moments. Um, I, you know, one of the things that, one of the biggest lessons of leaving, I left with this idea that now I'll just get to do all the stuff I want to do 100% of the time. And then when I would have to do stuff that I didn't want to do, I'd feel shame. Like if I was really doing my dream job, I wouldn't have to do all this stuff. I'd feel shame and failure. And I really have had to learn that's not the truth. Like there's no 100% perfect job where you just do the things you want to do all the time. You edit the podcast. Like, and maybe editing isn't the fun part. Maybe the conversation's the fun part. Well, you know why I edit the podcast and it brings up a different discussion? It's because it makes me a better speaker. Being that connected to something I think makes you better. And you probably have a lot of opportunities now that you don't have this huge staff like you did to get more connected to your work. Yeah. I, well, you've removed some of the layers and you're right where, um, even your calendar, like knowing, like managing your calendar, um, you know, interacting with clients, um, knowing that, okay, there's not a team, like I am the team and you, it's silly to go, how does being in charge of the catering help you stay connected to an event. Well, it definitely helps you stay connected to the costs, you know, where you go, <laughs> okay, we've got this amount of budget and this amount, or it definitely yeah. helps you stay connected to Kelly at the Entrepreneur Center who's going to help you and, and you appreciate her in a different way because now you see her. Oh, the appreciation is amazing. You've probably been in a situation of working where you go away and somebody's like, man, I didn't know how hard you worked. And, and you're finding that out all the time. Oh my gosh. Like I saw a girl named Becky that I used to work with um, at this event in Fusionsoft. And I was like, oh my gosh, Becky. And I immediately have this empathy. Like it increases your empathy. When you go through a situation like that, 
Um, it increases your empathy, and if you're willing, it'll also teach you some lessons about maybe some things you wish you'd done differently. Well, speaking of empathy, here's an opportunity for you to earn some. Tomorrow's the big day. 18 months you've been working on this project, but it really was the 30-something years before that. Mm -hmm. Culmination of everything. It's your first shot really on your own in a lot of ways. Yeah. How are you feeling? I want to get this on tape. This is a moment in time. It's like the time capsule. Yeah, I, I think I feel overwhelmed um, in some ways. I'm really excited. Um, I've really had to fight hard to not make the book my identity um, and not make the success or the size of the success a reflection of my identity. Um, and I think that's hard for, for small business owners, artists, anybody who launches something, you know, because you have to put your heart into it for it to be good then you also have to have this, this willingness to kind of let it go out into the market and let the market experience it and appreciate it the ways they want to experience it. So, yeah, I feel really excited. I think, I think it's the best thing I've ever written, and there's, there's a few reasons I think that. Um, I've always respected John Mayer um, when he said, like, this other album wasn't good, you know, or this other album I did wasn't my best. And so for me, like, even just the fact that I didn't let Jenny, my wife, um, read start until it was published like she never saw it before because i was afraid of what her feedback would be and with do over when you're on your own and you're in your house and your wife is there reading it nine times and calling you out on stuff that you know is ego driven um, right. or you're trying to look like a victim or you're just like that made the writing better and it made it leaner and it made you know a book that i think a lot of people get helped by um and so that's, yeah, so I'm overwhelmed, but I'm also really excited. And the other thing is, and you know this, it's a sprint and a marathon. Like the big thing with a book launch or an album launch or a business launch is that there's the opening day. You cut the ribbon. Like what an exciting day. And then you sell it and share it for the rest of your life. And there's this marathon and you contribute to find ways to connect it to people's lives. You continue to lean into it and be excited about it. So it's kind of this balance. I love that you're approaching this like a marathon because being in the book business, the publishing business, I've seen a lot of people have a great opening day. They've got 100 five-star reviews. They're number one because it's easy to the gain 100 the five-star review is so funny to me, by the way. It's just you asking 100 friends who like you. It's silly. I like it. It, it when, doesn't even look right no, because nobody believes it. Like you've got some three star reviews right now from people. From who, Amazon Vine. From Amazon Vine. They got the never book met beforehand. Me. They yeah. don't know you. One guy was like, Oh, I don't relate to this. I'm 50, and and it's not a match for him. But at the same time, that three star review makes the five star reviews that are there look that much more real. Yeah, well, and and I really appreciated that they would say, you know, here's what I thought worked. Here's what, you know, and most of those Amazon Vine folks don't even read a ton of nonfiction, you know. And so that was, yeah, I was so glad that Amazon was willing to make it part of their program. But yeah, it is this weird thing where you stockpile five star reviews, and I think it's. I don't know. I always want, like, I'll ask people to write honest reviews. I'll never ask somebody to write a positive review. And there's a huge difference. If it hasn't helped you in the way I intended, let me know. That's what I say. If you like it, give me a great review. And if you don't like it, come to me so I can make the next one better. Exactly. Or you can leave a bad review, but yeah. probably not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's be honest. Like, <laughs> I'm not, you're, there, no, that's such false nobility to be like, if it was a one star, please write that on Amazon's page. I'll read that. I'm not reading those. I just want to be up front. I can't emotionally handle that. So if you want to write a one star review, that's fine. Just know I will not be. So reading you skip that. them. Oh my gosh. Seth Godin hasn't read an Amazon review in three years. There's this whole mentality of you just have to kind of man up or be tough enough to read the hard reviews. Like, no, screw that. Like, I'm not reading one star reviews. It doesn't help me at all. It really doesn't because you don't know where those people are coming from. And the same with the good reviews. I mean, everybody's it's a got balance, an opinion, yeah, right? Sure. It is good to be loved, though, and I think that that's one of the things that is motivating, but you can't be motivated by just that. No, because when that stops, so will you. If you only do it for the applause, then you've now given the applause the power to control what you create. And so once the applause stops, and it will, um, you'll stop. So you've got to find something that regardless of the input, you're going to keep creating output. That sounded like a tweetable moment right there. Oh my gosh, that was fantastic. <laughs> Too bad podcasts don't have that button where we can uh, just make it easy. Click the tweet. <laughs> the book, Do Over, Rescue Monday, Reinvent Your Work and Never Get Stuck. It's going to be a fun launch to watch. You can pre-order it, order it, 
Just go to Amazon. You can get Today's it. Today's the last day for the pre-orders, so, and they're actually good. I've told this story. I, I created some really bad pre-order items, and uh, my wife read them and said, there's no way I'm letting you launch a great book with crappy pre-order You mean like items. bonuses? Yeah, bonuses. Every author right now, like, that's what you do. You create these bonuses, and then a lot of people go, they'll put this fake value on them. Like, it's a $1,000 bonus. You oh, go, yeah. Your eight-page PDF is $1,000? The, like, the John Acuff koozie, it's worth at least yeah, yeah, exactly. $45. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, who could, I mean, who could put a price on this? It's a $900 koozie. And then you go, <laughs> the package that you get today, today only, Nine thousand dollars right. for the price of one book. Nine thousand right. dollars. Will you pass that up? And you go, but I want you to trust me as an author. You know, and like so, you don't get to do both of those. So <laughs> I created a very small, like, work really hard on four special perks that you can get today. Last day, if you order um, doover.me, dot me, you'll get them. You gonna tell us what they are? Yeah, uh, thirty days of hustle ebook, and it's uh, it's actually like an eight thousand word step-by-step 30-day plan that I spent an entire year working with 10,000 people on. So this is going to help you have your do-over. It's yeah. assisting you with your knowledge that you get from the book. Exactly. There's a 10-day um, do-over challenge, which is kind of the quick version of I want to change one thing, um, and it's a step-by-step. Then there's an autographed book plate in case I don't come to your town and you still want to have the book signed. Um, I'll actually mail you a physical book plate, which in the the day of the internet is crazy that you can still get something that's not just a digital resource. And the last one's a webinar. We're doing a webinar that you'll get an invite to. So people will be able to ask you questions, interact if they're stuck. Exactly. And we can share, we can go over Q&A, and it's, it's a chance for me to do what I love to do in cities when I go there, kind of a meetup. By the way, you've got a great Facebook community, interactive. And what I love about it is it's not just you, but it's people helping people. We talked about the support system you get from your family. Some people are not in that situation, but you've got a huge community of people that can be that situation for you. Yeah, it's it's been amazing. The thing I love about it is it's not one to many and that it's me going in there and like I'm the superstar. It's they do stuff that I never find out about together. They, they hold their own events. You'll see people post a book cover, two book covers. You know, I'm working on an ebook. Which cover? And there'll be 200 comments. Um, it's kind of like what the internet used to be, in that it's encouraging. And some fan fiction on there, John and Jenny Aka. There's no fan fiction on it. That's next. Yeah, that's, that's my contribution. Oh yeah. As long as it's Amish romance, because in the Christian <laughs> space, that is crushing it. This is. Do Over Week on the Red Podcast, the book, Do Over, Rescue Monday, Reinvent Your Work, and Never Get Stuck. John Acuff is here with me all week. Two more episodes with him, 141 and 142. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next one. You've been listening to Red Podcast, real entrepreneur development. Subscribe today using iTunes, Stitcher, or via RSS at redpodcast.com. That's not, I guess that's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's felt more like a statement. That's a statement. Well, I'm, ag- I'm agreeing, I'm agreeing with you. Yes, though. that happens. Yeah.